morning. Good morning. We are in First Peter in chapter one, if you would. Continuing on in our study in First Peter. First Peter chapter one, and let's read the first three verses and we'll have a word of prayer. First Peter chapter one, Peter. An apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for for this gorgeous day. And we thank you, Father, for the good fellowship that we have here. We thank you, Father, for bringing us to this place at this time, Lord, to to sing your praises and to study your word. And Father, we pray that you would teach us and guide us through the truths that you have for us this morning in this study, throughout the service today. And Father, we pray for the saints everywhere, everywhere that your word is open this morning, Father, that they would be built up, edified, and strengthened to your glory. And we thank and we praise you in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Now here in uh, as we move along in First Peter, I think we've got uh, we've got two verses down so far, and uh, and we will be touching on verse three today as we uh, uh, try to move forward. But we're really kind of still in a introductory uh, portion of this of this study we talked about the author of the epistle we talked about peter and his apostleship and his ministry last week we talked about the audience of this epistle who uh who the epistle is is being written to and as we move into verse 3 verse 3 is going to give us uh an opportunity to kind of enlarge on that the um the audience that Peter is writing to, and it's it's critical that we understand the audience of this epistle, who it is and who it is not. So, first of all, let's get who it is not out of out of the way. Um, we we sometimes I forget to 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 go back to some basic things and to and to go over some things because I think that. Everybody uh, has them already. Everybody knows them already. And that may well be true. But uh, it's good, number one, to remind ourselves of these things, to remind ourselves uh, of, the, of the verses and of, the, of these basic truths uh, so that we can explain them to other people. And, of course, if there's someone who... Uh, who doesn't know? Then, then we don't want them getting, uh, you know, getting left behind just because the rest of us may. So, the position of this epistle in your Bible, as your Bible moves through time and through history, it also moves. I'm talking about your Bible, the books in your Bible, and how they're laid out. The Bible moves through dispensations as it moves through time. And in the Old Testament, you have, of course, the Old Covenant, the Old Dispensation, and most people see that and recognize that, that we're not in the Old Covenant anymore. Now we're in the New Testament times. So you've got Genesis to, to Malachi, essentially, covering that, that former time. Then as you move forward in your Bible, the next book there after the Old Testament is the book of Matthew. And the book of Matthew is a book of transition. People turn to the book of Matthew and they, and they immediately think New Testament. And Matthew is a transitional book. 
It's a, it, you're transitioning from the Old Testament into uh, the New. And in fact, what will one day become? the new covenant in its in its full. So when you turn into the book of Matthew, you're still in the Old Testament. Just because there's a page in your Bible between Malachi and Matthew that says New Testament doesn't mean that you're in in new covenant doctrine once you turn into Matthew. Matthew is an Old Testament book. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are Old Testament books doctrinally. And the book of Hebrews tell us, tells us that the New Testament could not have begun until after the death of the testator. And the death of the testator, our Lord Jesus Christ, occurs at the end of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Everything before that cannot possibly be New Testament. So says the Word of God. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. And Matthew, primarily of those four, is a, a book of transition. It's bringing you out of the Old Covenant for sure, but you're still there in the Old Covenant. It's looking forward to that movement into the New. Then you move past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you get the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is another book of transition. And the book of Acts, what, what you get in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is you get the, the purpose of God for his nation Israel, moving again from the Old Covenant into, into the New. In the book of Acts, that's where you begin, with the purpose of God continuing for the nation of Israel. The book of Acts is not what many people believe it to be, a... Um, uh, a, a telling of the birth and growth of the body of Christ. That's not what the book of Acts is about. The reason, the purpose for the book of Acts is to show the fall of Israel and salvation going to the Gentiles. So Acts is a transitional book. It starts out entirely Jewish. And, it, and the body of Christ is nowhere to be seen, including in Acts chapter 2. It's not until you get to the middle of the book, in around chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, most people make it chapter 9, I suppose, uh, where, the, where the body of Christ even appears. And then from there through the end of the book, the nation of Israel is still there. They're just diminishing, fading away as the body of Christ is um, is gaining uh, prominence and gaining ground in the purpose and moving of God. So Matthew's a transitional book. Things change in the book itself. Things in the beginning of the book are different from some other things at the end of the book. Uh, for example, Matthew chapter 10, the Lord tells his apostles... Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. To any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. By the time you get to 28, he says, Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So things change within the book itself. Acts is the same way. Things in the beginning of the book of Acts are different from things at the end. Then you come into the book of Romans, Romans through Philemon, the Pauline epistles. Those are the, the, the scripture to the body of Christ. Those are, that is the portion of the Bible that contains God's word to the people of God today in this dispensation, in this age. Then, that, that is coming out of that transitional book of Acts. And then you get Paul's epistles. Acts moves you from Israel's program into the salvation of the Gentiles and the body of Christ. Paul tells you about the body of Christ. Then after Philemon, you've got an epistle in your Bible called the Epistle to the Hebrews. And the Epistle to the Hebrews is another transitional book. Now, Hebrews is is not a transitional book like Matthew and Acts in that 
Hebrews is not a narrative. It doesn't. It's not telling a giving an account that covers a period of time. Matthew is a narrative. Acts is a narrative. So as time moves on in those books, things change. Hebrews not a narrative. Hebrews is an epistle. It's a letter. It's not. It's not recording history over a period of time. It's a letter. But it's a transitional book where it's placed in your Bible, where God has it in the Bible. Because after Paul's epistles, you come to the book of Hebrews and your Bible is taking you back. Back to the kingdom program, back to the Hebrews, back to the Jewish uh, kingdom doctrine. And you are no longer in the epistles that are written to the body of Christ. Here, in, and that includes Hebrews and James and Peter and, and all the way down through, John, Jude, and Revelation. These are Hebrew epistles. So here, as we're studying through First Peter, this is where we are in your Bible. You are in the Hebrew section of, of your Bible, of your New Testament, and that doesn't just mean it's a different people. It's the, the doctrine is different. There are things in this book that you and I that don't, don't apply to you and me. And if we try to make them apply, we end up in, in trouble and confusion. You break your neck in these epistles if you don't know who they're written to. So that's why we've spent the time that we have uh, talking about Peter, his apostleship, uh, and his audience. Now, Again, in that, in that vein, look at uh, verse 2. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So these are the people that this epistle is written to. You say, well, doesn't all of that apply to us? Uh, no. And here's what does not, when you say apply, you can, you understand that you can interpret the Bible and then you can make application of the Bible. Can we make application of all of these things? Sure we can. But is that verse written to you and me as members of the body of Christ? The, the, the thing about that sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, and we talked some about it last week, that has a specific uh, reference and connotation to it that applies to these people that Peter is writing to. And if you'll come back, come back with me to Exodus and chapter 29 and get... Uh, Get Exodus chapter 29, get Exodus 19 along with it, and we'll look at chapter 19 first. The book of Exodus, chapter 19 and chapter 29. Here, of course, in the Exodus, as we're turning to this book of the Bible, we understand what Exodus is. The children of Israel have been enslaved in bondage in Egypt, and God has come and miraculously delivered them from that bondage, brought him out uh, into the wilderness unto himself with the promise of taking them in to a land that flows with milk and honey. And Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now, look. What that verse does not say is, Thus shalt thou say to the body of Christ. Right? It says, To the house of Jacob, and to the children of Israel. So we know who this is who this is written to, who God is speaking to. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagle, eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. 
And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, the people, the Jews, they're going to be a holy nation. And you see what he says there? Above all people, for all the earth is mine. He says, and you're going to be unto me a kingdom of priests in verse 6 there. Now it's that kingdom of priests that you're that you're preparing for as you come into Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and it's that kingdom of priests that you're returning to in those uh, Hebrew epistles the book of Hebrews has more to say about the Old Testament priesthood and the and the change and the move and the transition into the New Testament priesthood than any other book in the Bible. And Peter is writing to those same people. Now, before we look at chapter 29, I know I got you there, hold on to that, and look back at chapter 3, because you see where... The Lord says to these people, you're going to be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Exodus chapter 3, and let's make it chapter 4. God is going to set this nation, this nation that of, of, of believing scattered Jews that Peter's writing to. He's going to set them, he's going to give them a position. We saw Peter say that the people he's writing to are elect. And we talked about that. You're elected to a position. And that position is that place above all other nations. And God says, because all the earth is mine, and I'm going to set you in the number one place. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. Before the deliverance from Egypt, now God is getting Moses ready to go into Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return unto Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders uh, before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now the nation of Israel is is being given a position. All the earth is God's. Paul tells us in in Acts chapter 17 that talking to all of those Gentiles, he says we're all the offspring of God. All the earth is mine, the Lord says. But I'm going to put you above all people. What he's talking about there is making Israel the firstborn. Giving them that position we've talked about before, what it means to be the firstborn. Giving them that that head uh, position and primary inheritance. So the nation of Israel is preparing to be the firstborn uh, of, of all nations. Now in Exodus chapter 29, because part of that firstborn... And being the firstborn is that you are the priest for the family. We've we've looked at this before, and we and and it would be too far off the track of First Peter to 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 spend all a lot of time talking about the different things that the firstborn means. But when Cain and Abel had their falling out together. Because Cain brought a sacrifice, and Abel brought a sacrifice, and Cain brought the wrong one, and Abel brought the right one. That was for Cain to do, to bring the sacrifice. Because he was the firstborn. He's the priest. He is over Abel in, in, the, uh, in the religious hierarchy of that family. And when he didn't do it right... And Abel said, no, wait a minute. 
and he came and brought the right sacrifice, that caused a problem. Because that wasn't Abel's place to do, it was Cain's place to do, but Cain wouldn't bring what God wanted, so Abel had to do it. But that was Cain's position, because he was the firstborn. The firstborn in the in the family is is the uh, is the representative of the rest of the family before God. They are the priest of the family. Israel is going to be God's firstborn. All the earth is His, but Israel is going to be His firstborn. Uh, is His firstborn? Exodus twenty nine. Okay, so Israel's going to be, Moses says that one day, if you'll keep my voice, obey my commandments, I'm going to make you a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. So what do you have to do to a priest? And we've all seen these verses before. In order to prepare them to function as priests. Exodus 29. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, to hallow them. We know that word hallow, it means to sanctify. Peter's writing to some people who are sanctified by, by the Spirit. Hallow them to minister unto me in the priest's office. And uh, we won't read all of these verses, but there's some sacrifices there that you can see. And verse 4, Aaron and his son thou shalt bring to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. So the first thing you do to a priest, verse 2 and 3 are preparatory. You've got to gather some stuff. Then you take the priest in verse 4 and you wash him with water. That's why when you open your New Testament into the book of Matthew, the first thing you find God doing is baptizing that people. Because that's the first thing that you have to do to get a priest ready to sanctify, hallow him, to function in the priest's office. You have to wash him with water. Then, um, there's uh, some garments there in, in, in verses 5 and 6, uh, depicting the, the uh, righteousness. We understand what those, uh, what those robes and, and garments are when you clothe yourself in, in the clothing of God. Then verse 7, And thou shalt take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. So the first thing you do is you wash him with water. The second thing you do after you put the clothes on him is you anoint him. That, you've got the baptism with water. Then you've got that anointing of oil. That's what the Lord did with these people that Peter's writing to. Peter says, he tells them in, in Acts chapter 2, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Get the water, and God will give you the oil. You've got you, you to gotta, you gotta wash him in water, then you need to anoint him with oil. So Peter says, To those that are elect according to the foreknowledge of God, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21. Exodus 29, 21. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron, upon his garments, upon his sons, upon the garments of his sons with him, the whole priestly family, and he shall be hallowed and his garments and his sons and his sons garments with him so that's what you've got to do to hallow somebody to the priest's office you have to wash him with water anoint him with oil and sprinkle him with blood and that's exactly what has happened with these people that Peter's writing to he's acknowledging that and he's reminding them of that now that priesthood Come with me to look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8. Now this, this idea of the whole nation being priests has, has been a controversial one. It's a controversial one in your Bible. Because if you recall, there was a couple guys in that wilderness uh, 
crowd in that mixed multitude in the wilderness called Dathan and Korah. You remember Dathan and Korah? Dathan and Korah decided that they were going to set themselves in opposition to Moses and Aaron. And Dathan and Korah's argument was that since all the people of God are holy, all the nation is, is a holy nation, they should all be priests. So they say to Moses and Aaron, Who art thou? What, who makest thou thyself to set yourself above the congregation of the Lord? They, they're saying that the, the Aaronic line and the Levitical line has no place claiming any kind of special priesthood because the whole nation is a nation of priests. But what they didn't get was that what God said was, and we, what we just read was, that if thou wilt obey my voice and keep my commandments, then thou shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. And Dathan and Korah took what God said shall be, and they decided that that must be true now. So what did they do? They failed to rightly divide the word of truth. They took something that God put out in the ages to come and they tried to apply that to themselves today. And we know what happened with Dathan and Korah. The earth opened up and swallowed them and them and their families and everything else went down alive into the pit. So show you what God thinks of you know, handling his word that way. But that idea of the whole nation being priests, God says that's going to happen one day. So how does that work with the Levitical priesthood? And aren't we just kind of uh, validating Dathan and Korah's argument by, by saying that? Well, here in Numbers chapter 8, you need to understand something about the Levitical priesthood that God established. Um, Numbers chapter 8, verse 5 we're going to get a few verses and skip and see if we can get the idea here. Verse 5, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Thus shalt thou do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them. So that's that washing with water. Let them shave all their flesh. Let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean. Now these are the Levites apart from the uh, the tribe of Aaron. These are the we, we understand how the Levitical priesthood works. You have uh, the tribe of Levi serve as the ministers of Israel. The family of Aaron, Aaron was a Levite, Moses and Aaron both, they were brothers, came from the tribe of Levi. Aaron and his family are the priests. Levi are the, the chief priests and so forth. The rest of the Levites are ministers of the tabernacle and ministers to the Aaronic priests. So when you when you talk you see the Bible mention priests and Levites, and you go, Well, I thought the Levites were the were the priests. There's a difference between priests and Levites. All priests are Levites, all Levites are not priests. Take the Levites, okay, cleanse them. Uh, verse 8. Then let them take a young bullock and his meat offering and find, okay, so we've got the sacrifices there, find flour mingled. Uh, bring the Levites, in verse 9, before the tabernacle uh, of the congregation. Thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together. So now you've got the Levites, they're gathered uh to the tabernacle, and the whole assembly of Israel is gathered together. And thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. Now you know what you put your hands upon something for? You do that with a sacrifice is what you do. Read on. Verse 11, And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. 
See, this is the kind of thing the, the Levites are offered as a as an offering. They don't kill them, but they're they the congregation, the whole congregation lays their hands on them like you lay your hand on the head of that goat before you kill it and transfer your iniquity onto it. They're laying their hands on the Levites, and the Levites are being offered. This is what Paul has in mind in Romans chapter twelve when he talks about uh, giving your body as a as an offering, as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice unto God. Um, that's what these folks are doing here. That they may execute the service of the Lord. And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullock. So the people lay their hands on the Levites. The Levites lay their hands on the bullock. And thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord, to make an atonement for the Levites. Um, Verse 15. After that uh, shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering, for they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel instead of such as open every womb, even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel have I taken them unto me. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast, on the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. So we remember now what God is talking about here. In the land of Egypt, God told the, the children of Israel after uh, nine plagues, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, he says, I've got one more plague, and after this one, they're going to let you go. And we know what that was. The Lord went through and slaughtered all the firstborn of Egypt. And the only reason that the firstborn of Israel wasn't slaughtered was because God had Moses and the children of Israel put that blood on the doorposts and on the lentils. And uh, when the, the angel of death saw that blood, he passed over that house. That's why we call it the Passover. Because God passed over uh, those, those people. When he did that, he sanctified all those firstborn Israelites that would otherwise have died in that plague to himself. What he's doing here, that is, when you sanctify someone to the Lord, Samuel's mom did that. She couldn't have a kid. And uh, she says, Lord, you give me a kid and, and, and I'll dedicate him to you. And he did and she did. And as soon as that kid was weaned, she gave him up to, to, uh, to Eli, uh, the priest. And he was raised in the, in, in the priesthood there, Samuel was. And, and as a servant of the Lord, she gave him to the Lord. So that's the idea there. What God is saying here now in Numbers chapter 8, all those firstborn are mine, but I'm not going to take all your firstborn and, and make them uh, serve me, dedicate their lives to serving me. I'm going to take the tribe of Levi as a substitute. The Levitical priesthood is a substitute priesthood. It's there instead of the firstborn. So when Read on here. All the firstborn, verse 17 again, of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them unto myself, and I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation. And he, and he goes on there. So the Levites are a gift. And again, like Paul says, that God in the body of Christ, he gave some apostles, God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the edification of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That's what the Lord is, is doing here. He's giving the Levites to the Aaronic priesthood, to the sons of Aaron, for the work of the ministry. That's a gift to them. 
And he's doing that as a substitute for the firstborn in Israel. Now, come over with me to Hebrews. So when Peter is writing to some people who are sprinkled with the blood, sanctified by the Spirit and, and sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, this is who he's writing to. These, these priests who are taking back the position of God's firstborn. The nation of Israel is being restored to her position, we're in Hebrews chapter 7, as firstborn of the world, the priests of, of the nations. Now Hebrews chapter 7, that what we're talking about here, that making Israel a nation, a kingdom of priests, is a integral part of the new covenant. We talk about being under the New Testament, the new covenant today, and we are in, in the spiritual working of it. But there are a lot of other things involved with the new covenant that you and I are not a part of of the New Covenant and of the, uh, of the New Testament. When Paul talks about the New Testament, he talks about it in terms of the Spirit as opposed to the letter. That's our connection with the New Testament. We've seen that. We saw that last week. When God establishes that New Covenant, the difference is not going to be, it's not going to be that the law goes away. The difference is that the law comes off of those tables of stone and into their hearts, and it becomes a spiritual matter for them. That's the new covenant. So that spiritual working, you and I are a part of. But there are so many other things involved with the new covenant. This priesthood being one of them. Hebrews chapter 7 says, verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So now here's another issue about someone other than a Levite being a priest. What that verse says is that the Levitical system was imperfect. And remember, that doesn't mean there were, that there were flaws in it. That means it wasn't full. It wasn't complete. The Levitical priesthood was a substitute. It was a temporary substitute for the, what would be the real thing. Who Peter is writing to are the real thing. Moving on here in, in Hebrews 7. For the priesthood being changed... There is made of necessity also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken, Jesus Christ, pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. So the writer is talking about the verse in the Psalms that says, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he's making the point here that the Lord, the Messiah, is supposed to be a priest. We all know it because there, there the verses are through the Old Testament. All the Hebrews know it. But Messiah is coming out of Judah. So how does the Messiah get to be a priest if he's not from the tribe of Levi? Well, he's not of the Levitical priesthood. He's not of the Aaronic priesthood. It's a new order. The whole kingdom is based on a new order. It's a new world order, that kingdom coming. It's called the new covenant. Everything becomes new. They're born again into that into that kingdom. That kingdom itself 
is called, the Lord calls it more than once, in the regeneration. Well, that's we have regeneration and we call that being born again. If you're going to use that term today for the body of Christ, it's that word regeneration that justifies its use. Paul never says we're born again. But he does say that we're regenerated. Well, what does regenerated mean? It means born again. That kingdom, the whole kingdom is called the regeneration. The birthing again. That's what, uh, it's it's a new order. So the priesthood, now, this priesthood that Hebrews is talking about, after the order of Melchizedek, verse 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, that is, Jesus Christ is made a priest, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So here is the, uh, the, the, the backing now for this new order, for this new priesthood. It isn't that law of carnal commandments that made the Levites priests. The Levites were substitutes. And it was that carnal law of commandments that made them what they were. The writer here says that this priesthood coming, that's not, that's not built on a law of carnal commandments. That priesthood stands on the power of an endless life on the power of the regeneration back in 1st Peter these people that we haven't even gone over the verses Isaiah and other places says thou shalt be called the priests of the Lord all the nations the stranger is going to be your plowman and your vine dressers and all the nations are going to come and they're going to serve you and you're going to serve them by being their priest and that's how that kingdom is going to be and that was God's intent the whole the whole time Israel is my firstborn Israel is going all nations are mine but Israel's my firstborn he's going to be the priest. First Peter, verse 2 again, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead these people are born again you think about being born again how do I get born again you got to trust that Jesus Christ died for your sins well that's not what this says you're born again by the resurrection the resurrection is that rebirth that that you're talking about when you when you talk about the term born again as the Bible uses it You're talking about that regeneration. You're talking about that kingdom. You're talking about the fulfillment of that new covenant. That's why grace people get kind of hinky sometimes when you use the term born again. They don't like that. Like I said, we're regenerated, and to me that's pretty much the same thing. But people get picky about it because Paul never says we're born again. And that nation as a whole is going to be born shall a nation be born at once and all throughout the prophets that nation is going to be born again they were born the first time out of Egypt God we just read I bear you on eagles wings God gave birth to that nation the first time that didn't work out so good under that old covenant they need to be born again under that new covenant and that It's that being born again, that regeneration, the power of an endless life, that by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is the the substance and the backing for their priesthood. Okay? So, those things, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
That means an awful lot to, to you and me in a lot of different ways. It means a lot to these Hebrew saints, but it means different things. It means different things. Here, it is the, the justification and the power of their priesthood. That's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That they can serve God, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, being born again, regenerated into that, into that kingdom. We'll leave it there. There's more to say about verse 3, but we'll move on from there next week. Do you have a question? I do. Yeah, Deb. When you first started, you mentioned that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're not really the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament and, books. Right. And Actually, Dave had told me that a long time ago. Um, why is it labeled in the book as part of the New Testament? It and is. Do well, it is that you're talking about the page that says New Testament. Yeah. It is the beginning of the transition into the new the New Testament. So it, it's the beginning of the end of of the old. If if you want. Uh, some justification for it and that's not inspired scripture that page in your Bible that says New Testament uh, it's there to help distinguish between the two parts Luke says that the law and the prophets were until John since that time the kingdom of God is preached so there is a division to be recognized there when with the appearance of John the Baptist and I suppose if I were putting a Bible together, I might say the kingdom or something rather than the New Testament. But the uh, to a lot of well, yeah, yeah. If you're not rightly dividing, if, if you're not rightly dividing, that you say my Bible says New Testament. Yeah, so, yeah. And yeah. they think I'm a Christian. New Testament's new. Right. So these books are to me. Yeah. Which utterly confuses everybody. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Very true. You have to uh, you have to study that out. You can't just take those uh, take those things for granted. What you got? Um, as far as the firstborn and the you know all throughout the Bible, like the firstborn loses their right, and mm-hmm. the secondborn. Right. So are we considered the secondborn? I could see where that would confuse people too, thinking that the the rights of the Israelites went to us. We the we the body of Christ. Yes. Actually, we are before the firstborn. Paul, Paul tells the Ephesians, and that's a good question, if Israel's the firstborn, are we the secondborn? And the fact is that we are, we are born before Israel. Because Paul, Paul talk, tells the Ephesians uh, that he, he talks about we who first trusted Christ. And he's talking about you being Gentiles and and uh, and not and separated in time past and all of those things, and he says we are those who first trusted in Christ. The body of Christ is. Well, you have to kind of look at that from an eternal perspective. When you when everything is all done, you're going to have the body of Christ, the nation of Israel, and the Gentile nations. So you're going to have those three groups. Uh, Jew, Gentile, Church of God, right? The Jew is is reigning with God over the Gentiles. The body of Christ is reigning in the heavenly places. So of the, all of those three groups in the kingdom of God, who first trusted in Christ? Well, the body of Christ did. Israel doesn't get their conversion until the, the body is done with. So actually, Israel's the firstborn, and we're before that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the uh, uh, being planned and, and decreed from before the foundation of the world as opposed to from the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? It does, but I would never figure it out on my own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, we, are, we are before the beginning. What you got, Johanna? Well, I was just going to comment that that what you just said about the first, we're being the body of Christ, and then Israel being the firstborn on that level, it's represented throughout the Bible, you know, with the births of uh, the twins, um, 
but Jacob had his children. Mm-hmm. Like Bev was just saying, a lot of times that firstborn is kind of is replaced, right. and that can cause confusion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We end up we end up being first, but we don't take the place of the firstborn, and that's where some of that confusion that you're talking about absolutely comes up. Yeah. Yeah, Alex. Um, in the kingdom, uh, the Levites are going to be priests. I, I don't understand why Christ is going to reign. He's he's the high priest. What is the necessity for the priest? Are they going to do the, all, all these sacrifices and everything? The, those were all foreshadows of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I can't see any necessity for the Levites in the kingdom. Well, it's not the Levites. It's going to be the whole nation. But I, I, I well, hear but I hear what you're saying. For a priesthood. Why have a priesthood at all, Is I think is what you're saying, right? Because Pardon? why have a priesthood at all is what yeah, you're right, saying. Exactly. Regardless of whether it's the Levites or whoever. Uh, there is still going to be mediator, need to be a mediator between uh, between God and men, between Jesus Christ and man. And yeah, you're right. A lot of those blood sacrifices are uh, are done away with. Not all of them, but uh, but the sin offerings and so forth. There are blood sacrifices that are not sin offerings. Yeah, but apart from that, the whole idea of a priest. See, people. They see Peter is going to say in, in the next chapter you, that you are a royal priesthood. And of course people take Peter for the body of Christ and they say, well we're priests. Well how are we priests? Well we pray for people. Well, a priest is a lot more than someone. Everyone in Israel could pray for their neighbors. That doesn't make you a priest just because you can intercede on someone's behalf through, through prayer. Being a priest has to do with if that person wants to come to God, they need to come through you. And that's, that's different. That's, we don't have anything like that today. The, the, the religions today that practice a priesthood say that if you want to come to God, you need to come through us. But that, that doesn't exist today. You and I as members of the body of Christ are not priests, but they will be in that kingdom. There's still a buffer between the Lord and all the nations, and that's the nation Israel. So some of those people in the kingdom, to come to Christ, would have to come through the priesthood. The, yep, ten, ten men out of all languages, of all the nations, will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And that's how you get to God in that kingdom, is by identifying yourself with that nation of priests. Makes sense. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay. Joe? I think it's just as important to understand why, why we are not some things as it is to what we are. Yeah. So it's so important that we read the entire Bible and study the entire Bible, not just Paul's epistles. Absolutely. It's really making me see the importance of, of, you know, I know now why I'm not going to be a priest and why I'm going to be in heaven. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and I only learned that through what was told to so Hebrews is written to us. It's, it's all, absolutely, all of the Bible, and I should say that every time, and that's one of those things I, I take for granted and forget to say. All the Bible is for us, and you're absolutely right. It, it, it helps to, to see the contrast and to see what God has elected other people to in order to get a clearer understanding of our own election. Um, so all the Bible is for us. It's just not all written to us.